chapter of the book of Romans. I'm the word of prayer. Our Father, we're grateful this morning that we have a Savior that's had a And Father, we thank you this morning that that Savior is able to make himself real to us in all of our circumstances. Lord, as we wait on you today with this congregation, we know that there is no life apart from you. And Father, we are waiting on the life of Jesus to manifest himself in our mortal bodies as well as in our spiritual lives. And now, Father, even control the atmosphere today in every way. And Father, hope and through the glory of God. Now, Father, we know that your ways are not to our ways. Our ways are not your ways, and, and Father, you'll have to conform us. And Father, many times we're so ignorant of your ways that we're not even willing to cooperate. Uh, we're not even, we do not even know how to cooperate. So, Father, in this light, we look to you to work in us this morning. That which is necessary, whether we realize it or not, to carry on and do what you want us to do. In the name of the Lord Jesus, do we pray, and for thy sake, Lord, do we ask for you today. Amen. In these morning services, I have... Uh, really just been talking to you about God's provision in reality uh, because we do have to have some kind of understanding of the provisions of the Lord. This uh, gives us information whereby the Holy Spirit can give us revelation. There's a sequence by which most people have to experience the reality of God and uh, one is uh, desperation, which is a need, and the other then is after desperation, a need is uh, there, then there is revelation, and then after revelation comes appropriation, and then after appropriation comes a demonstration. And this is really the sequence of action in the Bible. It seems that all of the saints of God went through the same sequence and we have to go through it. There comes a drastic need in our lives by some measure or another. And then after that drastic need, God penetrates with revelation. And revelation is nothing but the truth of God made real to you. And then after, when you get revelation, then there is a uh, appropriation, which is an act of faith. And then after that, after faith, comes a demonstration from God. And this is so beautifully put in the Bible. And I want to, to uh, you folks to pray, uh, especially for me this, uh, these next few days. I have uh, been asked by Broadman Press to write a book on faith. And it is almost completed. Next week we're supposed to finish it. And I deal with the subject of faith constantly all the way through it. And of course one of the things, one chapter in it, is um, the progression of faith from all of these steps. Now it's a little more in detail in the book. And it's supposed to be uh, finished far uh, on the draft is supposed to be finished so I can submit it next week, and you pray that the Lord will be uh, on top of that, and working in that as the, as the writer that's doing the writing, and finishing that up this week, and then I'll, you know, together go over it next week, and so that the Lord may just have his way in that particular book, but in that uh, study, I've been, been watching very closely this progression. And the Lord always starts out, it seems like, in a man with a need. And your need is an indication that God wants to be something. And if you ever see that your need is that indication, it would 
really help you out. And this morning I'm just talking to you. Uh, I want to lay down a principle, and it's the principle of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Uh, and made you free from the law of sin and death. Now that's the second verse of the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. But I just want to talk around this a little while because uh, we need to get some help from it. And if you'd like, you might turn with me to one of my favorite passages of scripture in the book of First John, the fourth chapter, and I believe it's the seventeenth verse. And look at that verse for just a moment. And this will help us to get out of the sense world into the spirit world and let God speak to us. Here is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because, now watch these words, and these words are so fascinating and so uh, powerful. Because, now watch this, as he is, so are we in this world. Oh my, what, what a statement. Now can, can you think about that this morning? Now just think with me for a few minutes and what I'm doing is uh, getting your attention at least, I pray, and I pray the Holy Spirit do more than just your attention on, on the truth. As he is, as he is, now it does not say as he was, and it does not say as he will be. It says as he is right now. Now you think something beautiful. Now you go back to the life of Jesus. Now I know we take these verses that Jesus uh, taught during the days of his earthly ministry. And we uh, we see him, we think that we're talking about uh, as he was in that day. As he was. But no, it says as he is right now. We are right now. He said, Brother Man, I didn't say, I, I just can't understand that. No, you can't. You can't say comprehend it. No, you can't. But it's so regardless of what you comprehend. Now, the same thing about God's word is this. It is so whether you believe it so or not. And then when you see and believe it's so, it means you act on it. Then it becomes so experiential in you. There's another verse like this, that our old man is crucified with Christ. And in reality, the original it says that our old man was crucified with Christ. And when Jesus died on the cross, your old man, which gives you a lot of trouble, uh, died too. Or you say, well, Brother Manley, in my personal daily experience, my old man is not crucified dead with Christ. Well, that may be true in your daily experience, but in the Bible, it's true. And when you see you agree with the Bible by the act of faith, then it becomes true in you. And a lot of our preachers preach a dual nature message and said, well, we have two natures, the old and the new which is absolutely right. And uh, that boy at the battle from here till you get to the graveyard, I beg your pardon. They shut it down too quick. They said, well, isn't it the true story about the old Indian who said that since he got saved, he had a war going on in him, like two dogs fighting, the black one and the white one. And someone asked him, to, uh, after he said, I have like two dogs fighting in me, a black one and a white one, and they're always fighting. Someone said, well, which one wins? He said, the one I say sick them to. Well, now that may be a beautiful story, but that's not theology. Now, you do have two natures within you. And uh, when you get saved, you do not get the old nature eradicated. The Bible doesn't really teach the eradication of the old nature. But it does teach death of the old man. And my friends, when you believe it so, actively believe it so, now remember, I'm using this believing in the context of the messages that I brought on faith. When you believe it so, it is so, but when you cease to actively believe it so, it's not so anymore. So it's very beautifully put if you just see what I'm trying to say, and all I'm really doing is talking to you on a principle 
I'm just giving you some verses to get you, uh, get you with me uh, so I can say something to you. <laughs> Amen. And uh, that is this, that our old man is crucified if you have the two natures and you get saved. They are warring against one another. And uh, you get in a good revival meeting and, and uh, you get to see this new nature or uh, the, the Christ life. And my, you, it gets strong and powerful and mighty. And you have some measure of victory for a few weeks and you're back gone back again. But uh, until you learn that this old man, this old man is crucified with Christ and reckon and count him on that basis, then you'll never have what you consider a consistent revival. Because you see, you just see from one nature and you're, and the other one is just is not in the position that God says he's in. And so here you go. And here, here you are, your old nature is uh, here, and after a few weeks he raises back up. Now as long as you actively believe that the old man is crucified, God, by his grace, holds that old man in death. And the new man is alive, and he has complete control over your life. Now the Bible thing I want you to see is the Bible says that that old man is crucified. Now your sense world, your environment every day, tells you he's not. But now which one are you going to believe? You see. Are you going to take God in his word? Or are you going to take the sense world and its manifestations and believe it? Now which one are you going to go with? As I said the other morning, the issue is which one is real truth? Well, that's had me so on the conviction this week, I haven't rested at all. I mean, the Lord is just really said, Now, son, which one will you believe is true? And here's what he's saying here. As he is, so are we. Where? In the world to come? No. Even says right now. He said, In this world. Now, I usually preach the whole sermon on this, and I'm not this morning, but there's a beautiful outline, as he is, so are we, where? In this world, right now. I'm not waiting until I get to heaven to enjoy heaven, brother. I'm enjoying the Lord right now. Now, as he is, he's victorious, and he's an overcomer, isn't he? Isn't he? What else is it? What is he this morning at the Father's right hand? Is he seated in the heavenly places? He's overcomer. He's victor. He's seated in the heavenly places. What else is he this morning? Well, as he is today, so are you right now. That's hard to believe in. But it's still true because the Bible says so. And which one do you believe? Which one will you believe? That's amazing. Mm. That's amazing. You see, uh, John, First John, four four says, "Ye are God, little children, because uh, children, and have overcome them." He didn't say you're going to overcome. He said you have overcome. See, John says you're already overcomers. He said, Brother Man, I'm not an overcomer. Yes, you are. You don't know it. And since you don't know it, you aren't. But if you ever know you are, then you are. You see, this is why I can't agree with Pentecostal folks who say, Y'all are the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is why they have so many false experiences speaking of the baptism. You down and pray for the baptism. That's stupid. And you tell them I said so. Excuse me, is it? He said, Brother Now, haven't you ever done that? I have. He said, Well, what's the matter? You have stupid. Isn't it? I was trying to get in a room I was already in. What I needed was my eyes open. Amen. 
to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the Spirit like that is to pray, it would be the same identical prayer, is to pray for God to let Jesus Christ come back down out of heaven, down on the cross again, and go back to the whole plan of redemption so you could be saved. And it's just through, it's through for him to do that, and so for you to pray that, because he's already done that. What you need as a lost sinner is to have your eyes open to the fact of what Jesus has already done on the cross of Calvary for you. And when you see that, it's already settled. God's side, judicially, historically, positionally, it's settled. When you see it, you accept it, and then it becomes reality in you. You see? And when you act, you don't throw your will open to anything. You throw your will open to reveal things, and you won't get a demonic experience. But when you get down and start seeking the work of the Holy Spirit, and just you are sincere, you're honest, and you want God to do something for you, you just open your will, my dear friend, and you're willing for anything to happen, your will is open, you can have a demonic experience. You should never leap into the dark, always into the light. And beloved, this is the light of the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit will make it real to you. I'm not making fun of any kind of group. I'm just pointing out some fallacies in some areas of which I know people have gotten me stuck in. Because, see, I've seen people get baptisms and have bits of tongues and all this, all the time of experience with them. But six months later, they come up and start telling future events, and now they're over in Russia. And, boy, they tell these things are going to happen. Of course, that's not like that. They're so staged and caught in their ways, they wouldn't. They, 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 brother, it takes a brick bat or something over their head to even get them wake up even more, God. Amen. They ain't just bad sick as the other body. I'm not blaming one group more than the other or anything. I'm just simply saying, folks, it's unwise to open your will to anything but reveal truth. The truth of God. And, um, and the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. What do you believe? Will you believe your senses or will you believe God's word? If you believe your senses, you'll stay in the If you take God in his word and believe, act on his word, then my friends, you are going to have this experience to become real in you. It's going to become really real in you. Now, let's turn back to Romans, the chapter, and talk about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Let's read the first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the flesh, but as, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law what is, of sin and death. Ah, boy, I love this. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, uh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, and you can read on and on and on. Now, the universe is set up on law, and these laws operate. Now, my friends, you don't have to, and I think you're aware of this, you don't have to do anything to lose your temper. Just let yourself go, right? Just let yourself go, and you'll naturally lose your temper, won't you? Just let yourself go, and you'll just naturally do wrong, right? Do you know why? Because there is a law working in you. Now, I have a watch here, and I can turn that watch loose, just turn it loose, and it'll fall. You know why? That watch is operating under a law. The law of gravity. I don't have to throw it down. I can just turn it loose. Because it's and that law will just put it down, just like that. Which is natural, as natural as it can be, right? It's a law. It's an absolutely law. 
Now, every man, woman, boy, and girl in this world has the law of sin and death in their body. Every one of them. And my dear friend, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did not only come and die on the cross of Calvary to pay the price that you might be set free from that law of sin and death. That's not all Jesus did. That was just the dying on the cross of Calvary was the price that was paid, not the procedure that was made. He died on the cross of Calvary, beloved, to pay the price for sin, for the wages of sin and death. But the gift of God is eternal life, not in heaven, now, and in heaven. And what the law could not do. You see, you, see, you read that again. It says Jesus came down in human flesh. And not only did he die on the cross to pay the price for sin, but he died on the cross and was resurrected, resurrected in order to overcome the law of sin and the law of death. Whereby, right now, you can stand without any condemnation. Any condemnation by the law. Any condemnation by God. You can stand before God as perfect as Jesus through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's saying something. Now, here's what I want you to see. That every one of us this morning that's been saved by the grace of God, whether you are experiencing it or not, you have the law of life in Christ Jesus in you. You have that law. Now you know you've been paid for and your sins are forgiven and you're on the road to heaven. But it may be this morning that you do not know that, my friends, there is a law working in your person. And that law is there for a purpose. And that law is there not for just one purpose, for many reasons, but that law is there to set you free from condemnation. That law is there to set you free from sinning. For sin should be an exception and not the law. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Not when we sin, we, if we sin. Of course, if a man says he doesn't have sin, he's a liar, and the truth not in it, the Bible says. But, beloved, it should be an exception when a child of God sins. And um, then not only that, but this law not only brings us to the place where there's no condemnation and where we have victory over sin, but this law is there to operate to give us victory over death. Over death. That doesn't mean you don't die. But it means that right now, you've got a dead body on and you just don't know it. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this what? Body of death. You see, your, your body, as far as God is concerned, is nothing but an earthly vessel. Dead. Yes. Dead. Yes. And he's going to deliver that earthen body and give it daily life. The law of the Spirit is in Christ Jesus. This is, an, this is a law. And one law or others working in you this morning. Now, when you got saved by the grace of God, washed in the blood of the Lamb, you got the life, the law of life. It's Jesus. And He's working in you this morning. Now, He may not be giving, you may not be having victory over sin and over condemnation and over death. 
For instance, this morning, if uh, I'll deal with the next part just a moment, if you take your body and it gets weak enough, you start going to the gas. You know why the law of gravitation overcomes the law of life? Right? And that law of gravitation pulls you down, and you may be a person that, as far as you're concerned, alive, but that is sickness in you. In other words, you're not healthy. First thing you know, you'd be lying there, <laughs> and maybe uh, permanently. But you see, that's that law working in you. But there's also a law of life. Now, you watch this watch. Let's go back to that law of gravity. That law, that law if I tell you what's loose, it goes down. The law of gravity pulls it down. But now, you watch this watch. I'm going to take this watch, and I'm going to let the operation of the law of gravity operate on it. And it dropped. The poker didn't hit the poker. You know why? There's a law now that's operating on this watch that's stronger than the law of that. And you know what that law did? It's holding that watch up. And it's doing something for that watch it couldn't do for itself. Right? It's holding it up. It's holding it up. Now see, the laws of the Bible says do and don't. Do and don't. And they demand. Now I'm talking about the judicial, moral laws of the Bible. They say do and don't. And the law you know, of death and sin in you is working against you. And the law says do this and don't do that, and that law of sin and death is working in you, pulling you down like the law of death and sin to death. And what that law could not do, what the demands of God could not do, Jesus Christ came into the world and took up on himself a body, lived it out, died, and was resurrected, and then he himself comes within you and gives you the law of life in Christ Jesus. And that law of life is like that law holding that watch up. And that law is working in you. To do what? To keep you from sinning, to keep you from dying, and to keep you from being condemned. Whereby the do's and the don'ts of the Bible are perfectly lived up to. To where there's no condemnation in your life. And it's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that what you need to do this work. For what the law could not do, Jesus himself came and took up his abode in you, the law of life in Christ Jesus, to set you free from all the other laws. The law, the moral law, set you free from judicial law, set you free from the law of sin and death. For well, my dear friends, you can have victory over sin, where you can have victory over death, where you can have victory over condemnation. And it's not you. It's the law of the life of Christ Jesus in you that's giving you this victory. That's why it's so erroneous to teach a person to get saved. And then when they get saved, tell them just now, the next thing is go out and do the best you can. Amen. Try your best. Read your Bible and pray, and witness, and be faithful to church and give your tithes. Boy, that's about it. And your spirituality is marked off on how many checks you put on the thing you report. And that is absolutely ridiculous. Amen. Now, if the law of life in Christ Jesus is working in you, I'm pretty sure you could put down a good report on the thing you need to report. <laughs> but you get in the cart before the heart is Well, you see, God knows you. 
and he knows you for what you are. And do you know he's not upset this morning at your Savior? As far as the Savior is concerned, you know what God expects out of you? Because he knows what you are. The only thing that, that God has a problem with is you bringing your life to submit to him where he can work that law of life in you. That's the only problem. That God has a problem with is you bringing your life to submit to him where he can work that law of life in you. That's the only problem. Because the rest of the problems, folks, he knows. And he can handle because he's already made provision for it. And of course, when you bring your unbelief, the sin and, and unbelief is nothing in this world but the lack of you committing, committing, acting on his revealed truth. Which means to him, obedience to him. And when you bring your captain to him, <laughs> When you get to him, then he can handle any other sin. He doesn't expect you to do it. He expects to enter you and do it. Now, I'll give you another illustration along this line. Uh, I won't get to bring this message, and I would, I'm not trying to sell a record or a tape, but I think you ought to hear this message. And it's uh, on the records out there. It's entitled The Overcoming Life. And uh, I think you can get it on a cassette, uh, too. And in fact, I know you can, if you don't want a record. It's the overcoming life. It's a, it's a chapter, Romans. It's an exposition of Romans 7. And uh, I believe it's the key uh, to a lot of truth that some of us need. But I want to give you an illustration that I give in there. And I understand uh, I did this to be one of the, the best I've ever used. If I had a glove up here this morning, and I, I put that glove right there, and I put that glove. Now, let me assume that I'm uh, taking the position of God in relationship to commanding a man to do something. And so uh, when God tells you to read your Bible in the Word, and tells you to witness, he tells you to do things of which he does, right? I'm going to tell this glove. I said, glove, pick up that watch. Now, that's a glove. I'm going to say, pick up that watch. Now, that glove, there, right by itself, right there, you can see it in the imagination. Can that glove pick up that watch? I say, now, glove, pick up that Bible. Can that glove do it? No, you know why? That glove, in reality, is dead. It's nothing. Now, it's hard for you to see this, but brother and sister, it's all. And you watch it. If I would take this hand, take that glove, and reach over and slip that hand in that glove, and put that hand in that glove, that glove on my hand, I could say, glove, pick up that watch. That glove could move over and pick up that watch. I'd say, glove, pick up that Bible. That glove would reach over and pick up that Bible. Okay. What's the difference? Still a glove. You know, there's something in that glove now that's got the ability to perform. And my friends, if you're saved by the grace of God this morning washed in the blood of the Lamb, you have Him who has the ability to perform. And when the law says, do this, do that, without the law of life in Christ Jesus operating in you, friends, you cannot operate. Now, because you have a human body, mind, motion, will, and so on, you can get up and go through the activity of performing. But folks, you still haven't learned the lesson that as far as God is concerned, it's not what you do for God. It's 
what God does to And the whole Sermon on the Mount becomes alive when you see this truth. I get tickled at folks saying some preachers are too negative. I don't think people have an understanding uh, to the extent of what they know negative or positive preaching when they hurt. My mother-in-law came to hear me preach one time and she said, and I have a brother-in-law that's uh, quite an outstanding evangelist in there. And she said, man, I said, you, you and Mike are so different. She said, he's so positive and you're so negative. So, uh, and what she was wanting me to be is one of these uh, fellows who was never the object of any criticism. And you just can't be in walk with Jesus. And uh, one of the first things you want to be in the controversy is you walk with Jesus. You know, you don't want you to rock the boat. And uh, so, uh, and I noticed when she had a few heart attacks and a few other things, she got interested in the fellow who rocked the boat so far. But anyway, it was quite amusing. She was, she's a real precious person. I had to put that in. And, <laughs> but she really is. And she's really deep in the Lord. She's gone through some unusual things in her life. And so she, uh, she said to me, she said, you're just too negative. I said, uh, well, we just pray. I said, tell me something. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you know, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's positive. I said, is that what you mean? I said, would you please tell me how you're going to love your neighbor as yourself? And she said, well, uh, well, I'm just going to love it. I said, yeah. I said, just suppose that your neighbor is a wicked, ungodly, uncouth, mean, devilish woman that irritates you and upset all of us. I said, how are you going to love her? She said, well, mm. she, she's pretty thoughty, you know. She said, mm. Mm. She said, well, she said, well, I'll try to have to love her. I said, well, how do you try to love her? I said, you may try, but just you go out the next morning. I said, here you go. You're going to put on love. And Boy, I'm going to love that woman today. I don't care what she does all the And I said, now, you're a very cultured woman. And I said, since you are, I said, you go out, and boy, she pulls a stunt she wasn't prepared for. And I said, inside of you, mm. you would really want to say something and do something. But you're too cultured. You're too much of a lady to do it. And the minister prayed to tell me, how are you going to love your neighbor as yourself? I wouldn't let she got she stuck me on the spot, so I wouldn't like to let her get on. And she said, well, I get down and ask God to help me. And I said, and how many times have you done that? She said, oh, many, many times. I said, uh, has he helped you? She said, no, I end up getting upset over the phone. I said, Miss Prince, I said, can't you see that what you call negative, positive preaching is nothing in this world but negative? Because everything God asks you to do, it's impossible to do in yourself. And I said, it's only there for the reason of bringing you to desperation where you have up your hands and said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this life? Then all at once, it's Jesus. Why? God doesn't. God commands me to love my neighbors myself, but He knows I can't. Now, I know I can't. Well, amen, I can. How? He is ready to let the law of life in Christ Jesus operate in you. And what happens? He becomes the love. And say, folks, when he becomes a love, you know what? He changes your disposition of such nature that law works in you the way you actually love that woman. And you love her, and that it's not you loving her, it's the Lord loving her to you. And you what? Then the law cannot condemn you. You're under no condemnation. Why? Because you love her. But it's the Lord that's the source of the love. You see, 
You say, preacher, I don't have any faith. And the Lord commands me to have faith. And I don't have any. You've been talking about believing God. I just don't have a lick of faith. Well, I just shared with you how you get it. Same way you get love. Amen. Same way. And the law of life in Christ Jesus can operate in you. And you can have what Paul said, the faith of Jesus. Paul said, I live this life by the faith. By his faith, not my faith. He said, boy, the source of my faith is the Lord. Isn't that something? He, he said that I am crucified with Christ. He said, I'm dead, yet I live. But it's not me, it's Christ that's doing the living in me. And he said, since he's doing the living in me, he said, yet I'm dead, and yet I live. That's something in it. It's really something. And it's because this law of life in Christ Jesus is operating in you. And that law can operate in you today. If you have to make you Seth read the Bible, folks, there's something wrong with your spiritual relationship and fellowship. You shouldn't just grab up the Bible and start reading. You should go back to the cross and say, Now, Lord, you cleanse me. And, Lord, you take over. I know that uh, my reading this Bible is strictly legalistic. And, boy, when he takes over and that law of life starts operating, you can't put that Bible down. It becomes a living word. It just jump out and get hold of it. When you have to make yourself go visiting because there's a visitation on Thursday night or Wednesday night, Tuesday night, then uh, something like that, then my friends, there's something wrong with your life. I wouldn't give you two bits for a man's Christianity to just go visiting on Thursday night. I believe that the man, if he's really walking in the Holy Spirit, will be a witness wherever he is, whatever he's doing, all the time, every time. You see? You know why the law of life is working in him? He can't keep his mouth shut. Because that law of life is working in him in such a way that folk have to very think that man is the Lord Jesus. And so uh, this law has set us free. That hasn't set us free from just condemnation, just then and there. Well, this law operating in you will set you free from so much that it will absolutely fascinate you. You know what this law sets you free from? A carnal mind. I mean, I'm looking at it. For the, to be carnal, for the they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnal minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace. Now, the law will set you free from a carnal mind. And this is a great need today. Our carnal minds get in our way. Our minds get in our way. And when the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is operating in you, my friends, you're not carnal minded. Which simply means you see things as God sees them. And when you see things as God sees them, folks, you get your eyes full. Amen. You see, the Lord's not worried about the events of this nation today. He's not concerned. You know why? He sees the whole thing. He knows the in from the beginning and he, it's going to turn out just right it's going to turn out all right and uh, you're not only free from the uh, being uh, carnal minded if you are uh, if you are if the spirit of the life in Christ Jesus has set you free but this is another fact if the spirit of life has set you free uh, you're free <coughs> from bondage to the extent that my dear friends uh, you're not condemned by any sin. Our dead body of Christ being you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And I, I'll just go and read this. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And that mortal body says, that means your body you're in right now. And do you know something else you're free from if you are, the law of life is working in you and operating in you? You are free from the law of sin and death and sickness. You say you don't get sick? 
I didn't say you didn't get sick. You say, well, what are you talking about? You are set free from that sickness to carry out the will of God. There's not one thing that God wants you to do if you are allowing the law of life in Christ Jesus to set you free that the Holy Spirit can quicken your mortal bodies to do. Now, I have seen some folk who have taken an illness and God put them in bed. And it took the law of life in Christ Jesus to set them free so they would be as free in that bed as Paul was in the jailhouse in order to be a prayer warrior that God wanted him to be all the time. And I'll tell you one thing, that takes the law of life in Christ Jesus to give you such freedom and peace and joy there in a the bed, never to get up, just to pray, as it does to walk around. But I'll tell you what, anything that God wants you to do, His will for your life, if the law of life in Christ Jesus is operating properly in your life, you are not bound by any kind of illness that will hinder. And that, that's saying a lot to a lot of people. But folks, it's still in the book. Corey Ken Boone is 84. Years ago, well, she was in her 70s, I guess, then, God spoke to her heart one day and said, uh, I want you to go to Japan. She said, Lord, I'm too old. She said, I'm 84. I said, it's 70 something. She said, my body just won't make it. And if you've ever seen her, she's a real tall person. And just naturally heavy. And she uh, had been in German prison camp. I forgot now for all those years, you know. And it's amazing how God just sustained her through all of that. It's, it's something else. And you ought to read her book. It's uh, The Hiding Place. It's something. And uh, she said, Lord, I just can't go. God said, I want you to go to Japan. And she said, all right, Lord, if you will show me that my body will not be a hindrance to your will, give me a promise where my, my body will not be a hindrance to your will she said I'll go and she said the Lord gave her the 11th verse that I just read to you if the spirit of Christ that law of life that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you he shall quicken your mortal body by his spirit she called the airport and got ticket and she went to Japan and I have a friend that was there he was a uh, major and she stayed in his home and he told me about her he said man I've never seen an old woman so young in all my life he said preacher she literally walk you to death he said she went everywhere testifying. He said, I just don't see how she can do it, except God must do it to her. Well, he had the answer. I, 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 you could bring Bertha Smith in. Have you ever read her book? You could bring her in here today. You know how old that woman is? I don't, I'm not going to divulge her age, but she's over 80 by a long margin. And I guarantee you she can get around better than some of you young ladies. Uh -huh. She really can. Somebody, in fact, it was Jack Taylor asked her, they said, Miss Bertha, when you, <laughs> said, when are you going to get you a lady to go around with you like Cory Tim Boone? She said, well, when I get as old, she is. <laughs> That's what she said. She's all, already older than she is. But she said, well, preacher, what's the secret? My soul, she's, a, she, she's just alive. But it's that resurrected life living in her. I knew Charles Weigel personally. 
You know the man that wrote, No one ever cares for me like Jesus? He lived to be 92. And when he was 90 something, I heard him get up and sing. Now you know more about this than I would, but I'm lesson pretty uh, high notes in that day. And he was 90 plus. And I heard him get up and sing that song and never missed him. It's amazing. Oh. And you know what God, he said, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And folks, oh, that's the word of God. Now which one are you going to stand with? The word or how you feel and think, smell, taste, see? All you see with the word. It goes right on down. You know what you're free from? Let me give you this one and let you go. You're free from something else. And this is a beauty. When you're set free by the law of life in Christ Jesus, you're set free from suffering. Suffering. Now, preacher, the Bible says you're suffering. I didn't say you did. I just said you're set free from it. How in the world are you set free from suffering? Paul said, I count this suffering to be a pleasant experience when I think about the glory that's going to be revealed because of it. It's not by the suffering being taken from you, but it's by the glory being given so much to you that you appreciate it. So you do suffer, but you don't suffer. Amen? That's right here in this book of Romans. Say, folks, there are 17 things that you're set free from right there in that book of Romans. Amen. 17 things. You're set free from being a defeat. He says, we're more than what? Did you know this morning the only testimony that you really have to the world that you're saved is that you're a conqueror? Did you know that? When I get up and tell you I'm saved, I'm saved, uh, you don't have any right, I mean, to believe that. And you have no way of knowing that unless the Spirit would bear witness. But when I say I'm saved and you look out and see my life as a conquering life, then you it's verified and certified that I'm saved. You see, only the victorious Christian is a Christian that's really got a testimony. Now, I didn't say you weren't saved. But it's only when you're having victory in your life that the man and the woman down the street can know that you've got something they don't have. How can, how can you testify that Jesus is real, who was a conqueror, if you're not being a conqueror? So when that law of life is really working in you, you're what? And he didn't say, by the way, a conqueror. He said you're more than one. <laughs> that means you're abundantly above one. That means you're not conquering. You're just conquering with delight. Amen? It doesn't mean you're just getting over by the skin of your teeth, but man, you're passing over so far <laughs> that the world knows you didn't climb the wall. Amen? <laughs> and it's a law that's working in you. And when that law is working, it's just as natural as the law of sin and death. Now, isn't the law of sin and death natural? You just let yourself go, and that law operates. Well, you let yourself go with Jesus. Let yourself go with Him positively act in faith taking God in his word and that law will operate in you just as natural as the opposite that's why the Christian life is a spontaneous life that's why it's spontaneous the first thing I look at in a person to see if they're real or not is to see if they're natural see if it's just natural. And you can tell in a moment if there's any put up. Well, if it just flows out, it's just natural. It's just ease. It just comes natural. Then folk, you know it's real. And you know it's real. 
because it works from a natural law. And so, this may not mean much to you this morning, uh, right this moment, but I think before the week's over, it will. I think it will. And I haven't given you any answers you didn't already have. Because you've got Jesus and you've got the answer. The problem is a lot of us don't know we have the answer. And this morning, that's my biggest problem. Is I, I've got the answer and don't know it. And God just keeps, keeps bringing me to new dimensions and showing me that I do have the answer. And it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Would you bow your heads? Father, we're grateful for this fellowship. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that can ignite it. Thank you for Jesus, who's come to operate in, in us the law of life and liberty, freedom to set us free. Thank you, Lord Jesus, this morning. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your part in the Word, the economy of God. Thank you, Lord, for folk that will listen. And I pray you'll revolutionize their life today. In Jesus' name.